Hello and welcome to another in the series of our talks on prayer. It's good to have you with us. My name's Jeannie and I'm one of the ministers at Cushalton Beaches Baptist Church. I love to hear stories about children and particularly children praying and I heard one this week that I really liked. A six-year-old was asked to say thank you to God for the Christmas dinner they were about to all eat. He took this very seriously and began by thanking God for pretty much everything in his life for his friends, for his family, for his favourite toys. And then he started on the Christmas dinner. He thanked God for the turkey, for the gravy, for the roast potatoes, for the carrots, for the peas, then on to the puddings and the custard. And there was a long pause. And after a little while, he looked up and said, if I thank God for the broccoli, won't he know that I'm lying? I really love that children are so honest and straightforward and we've got a lot to learn from that. Certainly Jesus told us, didn't he, to become like children in our relationship with God. Two weeks ago we were looking at personality and prayer and the ways in which the way that we're made can make some ways of praying more easy or more challenging for us. And this week we're looking at praying creatively. Why that topic? Well God is the creator of everything. So whether we particularly know it or not, each one of us has the ability within us to be creative. And there are many, many different ways to pray. I hope that some of the things we talk about today might encourage you to try something different in your prayer life as you build your friendship with God. Some of them will probably be more appealing than others, but sometimes it's really good to give something a bit of a go that's outside of our normal comfort zone. Two weeks ago, one of the things we looked at was the differences between extroverts and introverts. Extroverts can often find it easier to pray when they're doing something else, and that opens all sorts of creative possibilities. Perhaps the most obvious of those is a prayer walk. Take a walk around your locality, praying for the people who live in the houses there or the businesses that you pass. It's something that you can do, of course, with others too, socially distanced, of course, at the moment. Perhaps stop and pray at some of the community places that you will come past, so a hospital or a school, if it's out of school hours. You can pray silently or out loud, whichever you're most comfortable with. God's going to hear it either way. And sometimes your praying in those places may lead you on to action or to campaigning, and that is very much a part of your prayer too. Sometimes I think everyday activities can be really helpful as well in our praying. So if you're working in the garden, what about asking God, are there some things that you'd like to prune out of my life? Or is there something new that you might like to grow in it? It can be helpful as well sometimes to hold something like this holding cross as you pray. There's a lot in the Bible about different bodily positions as we pray and quite a few of them are mentioned. So there's sitting, standing, kneeling, with our face to the ground, or with raised hands. They're all mentioned at different parts in the Bible. Those bodily positions can mean different things to different people. I very frequently mess up, and I can find it helpful to simply lie on the ground with my face down as a way of saying to God how incredibly sorry I am. But actually I might also do that same thing when I'm very conscious of the presence of God. I often raise my hands in praise or worship, but I might also raise my hands when I'm praying about something that is really, really important to me, a way of kind of imploring, I guess, to God. We can even dance out our prayers, you know. You don't have to be good at dancing and no one else is going to see it. But it's a wonderful way of bodily expressing either our joy or our sorrow or all the things in between to God, the whole of us being involved in our prayer. Or if you have children or grandchildren around, why not pick up some Playmobil people or similar little figures? You can use them to express to God what you want to say, to lay one of them down as you say to God, I'm just tired, God, at the moment. Please give me your strength. Or you might want to use two of them and say, look, God, I want to draw closer to you as the little people get closer to each other. There's all sorts of possibilities. Introverts, on the other hand, tend to prefer silent prayer. 
It's really important at those times then to switch everything off, especially the phones. That kind of silent prayer can be really difficult, of course, if you have small children or other people around in the house, but it can be really important for us to do that, to just lay aside all the distractions that we have. One thing I found really helpful is something called breath prayers. These go back to the 6th century, and the idea is that you choose a simple phrase and on the breath in, you say half of that phrase. You can do this silently in your head. And on the breath out, you say the other phrase. So one of the oldest ones, for example, on the breath in, we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. And then on the breath out, we say, be merciful to me, a sinner. But there are all sorts of phrases that you can use. One of the ones I've found most helpful is a really simple one, that one that just goes as we breathe in, Abba Father, and as we breathe out, I belong to you. I find these breath prayers particularly helpful when I wake in the middle of the night and I'm not really capable of kind of praying anything that is too complicated. Why not write some of your own? Let us know what they are. It can be really helpful, I think. We also talked a couple of weeks ago about how some of us experience the world very much through our five senses. And again, that can give all sorts of creative opportunities. For example, when we're using everyday objects, they can become a way to help us in our praying. Perhaps we're cooking. And so we can use as we stir or do something with one of those objects, that as an opportunity to pray for those who are hungry. Or if we're gardening, we can pray for farmers. If we're reading, we can pray for teachers and so on. Any everyday object works just as well. You might want to light a candle, praying that God's light will shine in the dark places of our lives, but also the dark places of our world. You can use a map with brightly coloured pins as you pray for those particular places in God's world. Watching the news, of course, can very easily become something that leads us into prayer. Or even if you smell a fragrant flower, pray that God will send the fragrance of Jesus into the lives of those around you and into his wider world. Some of us, though, experience the world more through our imagination, through our kind of inner eye, if you like. And that, of course, also gives all sorts of creative opportunities. Why not take an imag imaginative walk with Jesus? Ask him, what are the things that he would like to say to you? What are the things that you would like to say to him? Or take a Bible story, something like Moses at the burning bush or Jesus blessing the children. Where might you be in the story? What might that tell you about what God is doing in your life at the moment? I also find it helpful if I'm praying for others, and especially if I don't know quite how to pray for them, to imagine Jesus with them. If they need comfort, I might simply imagine Jesus holding them. Or if they need his wisdom, I might imagine him speaking to them, telling them the way to go. Another difference though between us is some of us really like to analyse and to understand things, and that too has lots of opportunities. Our Bible study can lead us into prayer. So rather than it just be something that stays in our head, it, it goes to our hearts as we bring those things that we've studied to God in prayer. Something else that can be really helpful is to think systematically through the body of Jesus. So for example, as we think about his head, what are the thoughts that he might want to share with us? As we think about his eyes, how are the ways that he might want us to see the people around us or his wider world? What are the things that he might want us to listen to and so on? As well as doing this individually, we can also do this as we pray for the church. Paul described the church, didn't he, as the body of Christ. So we can pray for leaders, those who are seeking God's mind on particular issues, very valuable at the moment with all the implications of COVID-19. Or we can pray for those who are God's hands and feet in the community, bringing practical service. Some of us, rather than thinking so much about the world and experiencing it in that way, are very much led by our hearts. And that too opens all sorts of creative possibilities. We can draw stick people, for example,
different kind of pictures throughout the day that we've just had as we give the day to God. We don't have to be able to draw, I certainly can't, but it's just a way of expressing the feelings that have been with us through the day and giving them to God. A prayer journal is another way. It doesn't have to be written in words. You can use photographs, picture cut from a magazine, or simply something you've picked up like a feather or a leaf. Ways in which you can, again, give that day to God. Sometimes it's easier just to use colours to try and describe how we feel rather than drawing any objects. And then when we finish, we can perhaps write a scripture underneath it that expresses whatever we may have felt that day, what are the truths about God that underpin all the things that have been part of that. Sometimes thinking creatively can help us with what to pray about too. Holding a teaspoon, for example, teaspoon is TSP in recipes, can help us to remember to pray prayers around thanks, the T, sorry, the S, and please, the P. It's a really simple but helpful way, I think, to kind of um, structure our praying time. And it's very biblical. Psalm 95 reminds us to come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And of course, we all mess up and need to say sorry at times. John, the disciple, in his letter, writes these words. If we claim that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, make a clean breast of them, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge all of our wrongdoing. So that's a sorry. And then, of course, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus encourages us to ask God for what we need and for what others need. That's the please. And so these prayers of thank you, sorry and please can be made in all the creative ways that we've spoken about already and many, many more. If you have access to the Internet, then why not take a look? There are lots of sites that helpfully talk about all kinds of creative ways to pray. In Colossians 1, Paul writes these words. In Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been made through him and for him. Jesus is the source of everything and is for everything. He calls us to pray in all kinds of ways, all of the time. This means prayer can become not a chore, but a real adventure as we discover new things about God and new things about ourselves. Why not try some new things to pray this week and let us know how you get on. May God bless you richly. <laughs>